which will be led by Dr. Cheryl Finley. This lecture is in partnership with the Sotheby's Institute of Art and Spelman College. Uh, this is a partnership that had its genesis in December 2020 uh, to shape the future of the art industry. And uh, this is really an innovation um, between Sotheby's and Spelman. And it is designed to increase access to art market education for Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective undergraduate students. So I'm very pleased to announce that this evening's lecture is titled Crazy in Love with Collecting, Beyonce, Jay-Z, and Making Sense of the Art Market, a lecture by Dr. Cheryl Findlay. And I would like to introduce Dr. Findlay with a few words. Uh, Dr. Findlay is the inaugural Distinguished Visiting Director of the Atlanta University Center Collective for the Study of Art History and Curatorial Studies. She is the author of numerous um, books, namely uh, Committed to Memory, The Art of the Slave Ship Icon, Princeton uh, University Press, 2018. She has also has been uh, awarded for this publication, the Raymond uh, J. Horowitz Book Prize, uh, to honor the book as the, the best on the topic of decorative arts, design, history, and material culture of the Americas. Uh, Dr. Findlay's work has appeared in numerous academic and pop popular publications, including Aperture, NKA Journal of Contemporary African Art, American Quarterly, Art Forum, and Small Acts. She has been a co-author in numerous publications, namely My Soul Has Grown Deep, Black Art from the American South, Yale University Press, 2018, Tini Harris, Photographer, An American Story, and Diaspora, Memory Place, David Hammonds, Maria Magdalene, Campos Pons, Pamela Z, that was published by Prestel in 2008. She has also contributed to numerous catalog essays, uh, namely on the artist and uh, photographer Baroness uh, Habit, Terry Atkins, Lois May Lou Jones, Lorna Simpson, Hank Willis Thomas, Carrie May Weems, and Deborah Willis. Um, there are so many accomplishments. I'm quite humbled uh, to be in the same webinar as uh, um, Dr. Findlay this evening. Uh, her current research also examines the global art economy, focusing on the relationship among artists, museums, biennales, and migration in the book project, Black Market Inside the Art World. Her scholarly endeavors have been supported by the Ford Foundation, the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the National Gallery of Art, the Hutchings Center for African and African American Research, Harvard University, the Alphonse Fletcher Senior Fellowship, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Oh, my dear, on leave from Cornell University, uh, Dr. Finley is now Associate Professor of Art History. Dr. Finley is also a visiting professor at the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center at the University of Johannesburg and a member of the Advisory Committee of the Getty Research Center's African American Art History Initiative. Dr. Finley is a prize winning author. She has been widely published academically and has supported, is supported by some of the most respected scholarly institutions throughout the world. Dr. Finley is a specialist in the art market and she's currently researching global art economy. Without further ado, welcome Dr. Finley. Thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. I shall eclipse myself and looking very much uh, forward to this extraordinary lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. I'll see you uh, at the Q&A, yes? All right, well, good evening, everyone. It's, it's my great pleasure uh, to address you this evening to talk about a topic that, uh, that I'm not only researching, but um, that really drives a lot of um, what I do uh, as director of the Atlanta University Center Art History and Curatorial Studies Collective. And our mission is to prepare the next generation of African-American art historians and curators, leaders uh, in the art industry and in the art world as we know it. 
Um, and I hope that uh, a glimpse into some of my research will um, also help to solidify some of the work that we do at the AUC Art Collective. We're based in the Department of Art and Visual Culture at Spelman College. Um, and we're also at the Atlanta University Center, for those of you who don't know, the largest HBCU network in the world, uh, serving Spelman College, Clark Atlanta University, and Morehouse College. Uh, so um, if I could please see the slides. Thank you so much, Rachel. And I just wanna give a shout out. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to my, my team, uh, to Rachel Brown. Thank you so much for running the slides this evening. Uh, to Lauren Harris um, and to Jade Flint, um, who is a graduate student at Tulane um, and also working with us at the AUCR Collective um, as my research assistant. And she helped uh, with the research for uh, a different iteration um, of this presentation uh, uh, today. Um, I, I'd like to um, uh, not only thank my team, but I, I just also want to um, acknowledge, I think this is the great sense of um, uh, disruption and, and mourning many of us uh, might might be feeling um, with uh, the recent uh, uh, murder of, of a young man, uh, Mr. Wright, um, in uh, outside of Minneapolis uh, uh, at the hands of police. And, and I, I took the time uh, to try to um, really readjust some of the, 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 the presentation that I'm going to give to you today to really think about some of these pressing issues and how um, they are uh, and can be um, uh, in many ways affecting um, and helping to change uh, not just the art market, but the art industry as we know it. Um, so I'd like to begin um, with a, a couple of words um, from Queen Bey herself. Um, and this is actually uh, from uh, almost about a year ago um, on the occasion of the virtual uh, graduation celebration for the class of 2020. And she says, and I'm just gonna uh, begin with this, it's a bit of a long quote. Congratulations to the class of 2020. You've arrived here in the middle of a global crisis, a racial pandemic, a worldwide expression of outrage at the senseless killing of yet another unarmed black human being. And I'm gonna pause here and just say, it's as if, as if, um, these words uh, are being spoken today almost. Uh, and Beyonce goes on to say, and you still made it. We're so proud of you. Thank you for using your collective voice and letting the world know that Black Lives Matter. The killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and so many others have left us all broken. It has left the entire country searching for answers. We've seen that our collective hearts when put to positive action, could start the wheels of change. Real change has started with you, this new generation of high school and college graduates who we celebrate today, end quote. And again, that's Queen Bay from about a year ago. And I just want us to hold that close and dear. Um, I'm, I'm repeating that for students in our class. This is actually the first uh, graduating class that we have coming out of our our fledgling uh, program in art history and curatorial studies. And we're also very proud of you cur curatorial studies minors and art history majors and the many great things that you're going to go out into the world to do. Um, but I'd like for us to kind of just keep that close and dear and uh, as, as I continue on uh, with the slides. And Rachel, could I please have the next slide? Thank you. So, um, one of the things that I'm showing you here, um, and this is a, again, you know, a way for me to really try to kind of tune in with, with you know, my um, uh, absorption of, you know, the state in which we we are today in in this country, uh, but also to think through, of course, uh, through the lens of art, um, through the lens of contemporary art, and and also art history, and I'm showing you here an installation view of. A Promise Witness Remembrance. Um, it's an exhibition that just opened at the Speed Museum of Art, um, curated by Allison Glenn, an associate curator at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. Um, and I begin with this image because I want us to reflect not only on the power um, of this image of Brianna Taylor, uh, painted, of course, by Amy Sherald, um, 
but also um, the power of uh, museums and, and curators who are really thinking um, about ways to uh, change uh, the script of museums to the ways to also um, be in tune uh, with communities, um, the communities around which they are surrounded, um, the ways to be active and to activate um, how they can use their collections also to, uh, to respond to um, pressing issues of our times um, and also to remain relevant, to make the, um, the historic collections that they have um, relevant as well as contemporary works of art relevant uh, too. Um, could I please have the next slide, uh, Rachel? Thank you. So um, I'm showing you here an image that's probably uh, pretty familiar to most. Um, it's a film still uh, from uh, Black Panther, uh, a, a film that was uh, released by Marvel Studios in 2018, uh, directed by Ryan Coogler. Um, and this is a film that, um, as we, you know, we all know and love this film for the story that it tells and for the actors um, that we see in it. But this scene, which was actually filmed um, in Atlanta at the High Museum of Art, um, shows Eric Stevens, uh, who's also known as in the film uh, as Killmonger, as he gazes at looted African art um, on display um, in this museum, which is um, a museum that is called in the film, the Museum of Great Britain. Um, and he's gazing here at this work of art and works of art, um, but really with the, the eye on reclaiming um, a work um, that is a vibranium uh, artifact that is something that is very important to, to him and his history and, and his, his culture. Um, and this is a way in which we can look at this gesture that takes place. I'm not going to play uh, the video. I think we're all pretty familiar with it and just uh, in the essence of time, um, but it's a gesture that gives us a glimpse into um, not just you know, his history and his story more broadly, but it situates some of the earliest surviving artworks um, from West Africa within the confines of an imperialist um, uh, uh, museum structure but also um, within countries. Um, and it, this is a scene that also really helps to imagine uh, black agency uh, being taken back. Um, and I think we all know the ending of this particular scene when, wherein he uh, poisons uh, 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 the curator who comes to speak with him um, and is able to take this object with him. I, I show this image because um, when, I, when we're talking about the art market, we're talking about things like celebrity. And I would even bring in Marvel Studios and, and this really brilliant film um, to kind of think about the role of celebrity as it plays within art histories and the art market. Um, I'd bring that into the conversation. I'd bring it into the conversation of, you know, the, the great need to decolonize uh, uh, museums, historic encyclopedic museums, but even some of our more contemporary museums as well. Um, and I wanted to talk about this too, in terms of thinking about some of the relevant sort of uh, peripheral um, issues uh, that might seem peripheral, but they really are very much a part of the history of art and part of the way that contemporary actors are um, really trying to, in many ways, um, uh, take back, uh, bring back to reconsider um, works of art that were collected um, in imperial museums and um, encyclopedic museums, sometimes through a colonial conquest um, and other nefarious means. Rachel, may I please have the next slide? Thank you. And here I'm showing you an image of a gentleman um, who's made the headline, not the headlines, but uh, made the pages of uh, many national uh, uh, news media, not just um, art news media, but also mainline media, including the New York Times. Um, Wazulu Diambraza, who is outside of the Quai Branly Museum uh, in Paris. Um, and, you know, some might say, well, was he inspired by the, the heist that we just uh, saw, the heist that um, Killmonger pulled off in Black Panther? Um, but he's actually a Congolese activist, um, Wazulu Diabanza. And he's led several attempted uh, retrievals of African art in various European museums, including the Louvre, the Musée de Quai Branly, which is shown here, um, and the Museum of African, Oceanic, and Amerindian Arts. 
uh, throughout the latter half of, of 2020. Um, he has described his actions as, quote, uh, recuperating what is rightfully ours. Um, and most famously, uh, he and two fellow activists removed a Congolese funerary statue from the Africa Museum in Berg and Dahl last September while live streaming on Facebook. Um, and several minor, minor charges um, have been filed uh, and, and brought against the activists in Germany and in France, including their most recent sentencing in January of this year. Um, and so there's a way in which the sort of real life representations um, of, you know, uh, Killmonger's actions in Black Panther, um, um, you know, show that there are uh, comparable motives um, that make glaringly clear that museums need to think more critically about their collections and themselves as institutions. And I would say similarly too, that, you know, not just museums, but also um, collectors and also um, auction houses, uh, gallerists as well. So when we talk about you know, the issue of the art market and what the art market or the art industry is, it's a network of a number of different um, concerns that are sort of uh, overlapping. If you can imagine you know, uh, a vast network, uh, a cognitive map or any type of map that you might see and how you know, there are different ways in which um, through different uh, points and through points, uh, they're intersecting roads, intersections uh, between peoples and uh, people who have different kinds of interests um, that are shared. And so um, in thinking about these kinds of networks and the kinds of networks that um, involve things like trying to take back uh, works that have been uh, taken uh, from one's uh, homeland uh, years and years ago, um, we might also think about the way in which some of uh, the contemporary celebrities have also engaged with museums like the Louvre and other museums as well. And, and giving these two um, examples, the one from Black Panther and the one here of uh, the Congolese activist, um, I, I want to also point out the way in which, you know, ideas of return, return of cultural heritage, um, ideas that relate to and and sort of actions that are really taking place um, now uh, to, uh, to repatriate um, works of art uh, that have been taken. If we want to look at the example, for example, of the Benin bronzes uh, stolen uh, during um, a British invasion in the late 19th century, um, how these objects, which are in museums, encyclopedic museums, and even uh, smaller museums around the world, literally around the world, not just um, in the UK, but how many of these um, works are uh, now uh, being arranged uh, to be returned to Benin, where a museum uh, will be uh, built um, and opened um, in uh, the next couple of years uh, in advance of, I believe it's the 125th anniversary um, of this uh, horrific event that took, took place, a museum designed by none other than David Auger. Um, but I want to move forward to uh, the next slide to look at the work of um, uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z and to kind of begin thinking about uh, the way in which they have uh, been involved in and very much um, interested in uh, not just museums, but also um, collectors and uh, collecting in the art market. Um, and so in, in 2018, um, uh, they... Um, they, there was a, a very um, exciting uh, a, a video uh, that was uh, released. Uh, many of you have probably seen this, and this is just a GIF from the Ape Bleep, I'm not gonna say the word, um, a video that was filmed in the Louvre. Um, and, um, and this is a, a, a single uh, and only video. Um, it, was, it was from the album that was uh, released, uh, Everything uh, is Love. Um, and it takes place in Paris. And, and each coordinated frame um, really tries to uh, place, um, you know, and, and look at the Carters um, as they sort of reimagine um, uh, uh, different works of art or really place, you know, their, themselves um, and histories of relating to um, African-American and, and African history uh, to the works of art um, that are in the Louvre Museum. Um, and I think that, you know, in looking at this, this video, 
Um, you'll note how many of these important paintings, uh, works of art, sculpture um, that are throughout the Louvre, these are works of art that they themselves as, as art, art um, enthusiasts and collectors have enjoyed. Um, of course, works such as the Mona Lisa by Da Vinci and the Coronation of Napoleon by Jacques-Louis uh, David. Uh, these are two of the works that I think feature very prominently. Rachel, could I please have the next slide? Thank you. Um, and this is just another GIF um, from uh, the video. And so since the premiere of the, the video, um, the Louvre, um, which already ranked number one as the most visited museum in the world, uh, broke all their previous attendance records in, uh, in a 25% increase in visitorship. Uh, 10.8 million in total uh, people uh, visited compared to the previous year of 9.7 million visitors. Um, actually, that was in, in, uh, in 2012. And so it led the museum to create a special visitor guide um, based on the video, which was a huge success and gave the permanent collection um, what, what some people have said is, um, you know, a different, um, a different look, but also maybe um, a way to reimagine itself, a way to also uh, rebrand itself. Um, and so this is a, a guide that uh, is still in existence. Um, it's a step-by-step -step guide. If you can imagine, you know, going to an art museum and going to uh, a major um, touring uh, exhibition or retrospective that has an audio guide. And this is something that, that tours people through the museum so that they can sort of replay the uh, a bleep video in their minds um, in front of these works of art throughout the museum. And I think it's really important to consider the impact um, of the work of the Carters, uh, not just their work as collectors, but their work um, as celebrities, their celebrity brand, um, but the way that they have um, also always been um, socially conscious um, in care of Black people. Um, we can see this in other images. Could I have the next slide, please, Rachel? Um, such as the one that I'm showing you here. Um, on the left-hand side, you see uh, a scene um, from the video. Um, and on the right-hand side, they're visiting um, with their daughter, Blue Ivy, uh, in 2014. Um, and, you know, again, they've gone to see this work, the, the David, um, many, many times. And as I'm sure many of you here um, in the Zoom this, this, this evening, you have favorite works of art that you visit in museums all the time. You kind of go back to them, you share them with your friends, with your relatives, with your, with your children. And this is just an example um, of something like that um, in, in terms of the, the, the Carter's own practice. We could, could I have the next slide please, Rachel? We can also see the way in which um, they've, they've also been very interested too um, in you know, more iconic works of art at the Louvre um, and not just visiting you know, themselves to see the works of art, but um, I think one of the ways that in terms of thinking about you know, a way to um, go into this work on the art market through a different lens, it's actually through um, uh, Beyonce's own Instagram feed um, that you get to see that you know, she's uh, posting images of herself in front of iconic works of art. And what, what does that mean when she does that, uh, when she travels around the world to do that? Um, what does it mean uh, to those people who follow her? And how does that um, influence the way in which they imagine themselves as being part of an art world and also part of an art market? We can also look at, could I have the next slide please, Rachel? Um, other works uh, by Beyonce, um, in, including um, her very, very um, much discussed uh, uh, Grammy performance um, in 2017, the way in which she, you know, calls on images and icons of uh, African diasporic um, and um, history and culture and religious practices, um, and the way that she knows that, you know, she knows her history, her culture, um, and also knows ways to think about um, performance and narrative um, through her knowledge of history and culture, through her knowledge of religious practices, um, through her knowledge of the history of art and the way that um, it might influence others within the music industry, um, but also uh, throughout the art industry and the culture industry um, writ large. 
Could I please have the next image, Rachel? So if we look then at, um, at someone uh, like uh, you know, Jay-Z, again, looking at the other half of the pair, if you will, um, here I'm showing you an image from his uh, very uh, famous uh, music video production, Picasso Baby, um, which was uh, labeled a performance art video um, uh, from 2013. This was um, a performance art video that he produces um, at Pace Galleries in New York. And here he's seen on stage um, with Marina Abramovic, um, probably one of the best known uh, performance artists um, who um, had sort of a resurgence of her own career uh, in about 2010. Um, with a, a major retrospective of her work at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And so um, the inspiration for um, this short performance uh, film also stems from uh, the work of Abramovic. And um, it was a, a shoot that, you know, was really, really interesting in that um, on the day that this took place, a number of prominent um, artists, uh, filmmakers, uh, people who were writers, um, other rappers, um, uh, and performance artists were called um, to Pace Galleries to, uh, to participate um, in this performance art video and to kind of, you know, spar with him here on, on the stage. So some of the people who were present include the artist Fred Wilson, um, uh, Laurie Simmons, uh, Jacoby Satterwhite, and, and, and many, um, many, many others, even people who were part of the art industry um, as we know it, uh, prominent dealers uh, and gallerists um, and others who were involved in the art industry were very much a part of this. Um, and so to kind of think about, you know, the role of Jay-Z, um, where this takes place at Pace Galleries, again, if we're talking about, you know, a market, we can talk about museums and visitorship and how visitorship in the case of um, uh, the ape, Leap video at the Louvre really changes the, the face of the Louvre Museum. And we can talk about numbers there um, at the Louvre, that is, you know, how visitorship was increased. Um, but what does that mean? It's not just, um, so, for example, the, the cost of admission that might, um, you know, put more money uh, into, um, into uh, you know, the pockets of, of those, you know, who help uh, to you know, bring great art um, to the city of Paris uh, through through not the, not the pockets of the people at the museum, but you know, into the coffers of the museum itself. Um, but you know, but we can also talk about the way visitorship is something that is very much about access, right? We're talking about access, um, and so in creating that tour um, at the Louvre, the tour that was based on um, the work um, of the Carters, based on the video. Um, it not only enabled those visitors who took advantage of the tour to see the works of art at the Louvre in a different light, but it also enabled access to different kinds of visitors. It said to different kinds of visitors, it said to other communities that may not have previously felt welcome at the Louvre or felt that there was anything there that might be of interest to them, that this was a place too, that they were not only welcome, but they, they could also reimagine or imagine themselves in the works of art in that collection. And so in looking at, again, back at the image that we're seeing here, which is a, a still um, from Picasso Baby, I often talk about this, this particular example as a way of cross-branding. That is, if you look at the title, it's a performance art video, right? And so it's a way in which uh, Jay-Z um, brings his brand uh, to Pace Galleries and, you know, in a sort of vice versa way, Pace Galleries also lends its brand um, to, uh, to Jay-Z. And I think that, you know, a lot really happened here um, with this video. It was very, very popular. Um, and, you know, it, it also speaks to the way in which the Carters have been um, for a long time, uh, very much immersed in um, the contemporary art world, very much immersed in the, the blue chip contemporary art world um, as well. Um, and how this cross branding in the same way that one might say their presence at the Louvre in their A Bleep video, you know, brings a certain level of um, rebranding to the Louvre. Uh, we can say that this happens to Pace Galleries um, as well. And so um, 
I'm just going to show um, if I could have the next slide, Rachel, um, a quote um, from uh, Jay-Z and Picasso Baby, where he says, I want a Picasso in my casa. No, my castle. I'm a hasa. No, I'm a beep. I'm never satisfied. Can't knock my hustle. I want a Rothko. No, I want a brothel. And so on. So these are just some of the, the lines to, um, to this very well-known uh, music video, uh, music art video. And if I could have the next slide, please. Um, it also talks about, though, too, you know, the way in which um, there are many, many uh, rap artists, many contemporary um, music artists who often drop the names of um, artists, um, and these are mostly modern and contemporary, even Renaissance era artists. And if you see here um, in the work of Tahir Hemphill, um, who uh, did this really amazing study um, where he looks at uh, Picasso Baby uh, through an interactive map. Um, and this interactive map shows you how certain artists drop the name of, and, and I'm talking about music artists actually drop the names of uh, visual artists um, and you know how frequently you see um, some artists' uh, names dropped uh, by other art, some uh, visual artists' names dropped by um, by performing artists, um, and how they kind of intersect. Um, so, for example, a uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat, um, you know, being dropped frequently, and how um, there are others, you know, that are are looking at uh, Basquiat as someone who they mention um, in the lines of of their songs. Uh, Picasso being obviously one of the the biggest as well, um, but you know you can see that for Basquiat, um, Swiss Beats, um, and you know even I think Macklemore says you know would have dropped uh, Basquiat's name. So this is again thinking about celebrity, but also you know what the impact of celebrity um, has on the art industry and um, and and collecting, uh, but also how the impact of celebrity. Um, has impact on the recording music industry, but also um, on culture and on the way that we can advocate for um, uh, structural change uh, within um, the art industry. If I could please have the next slide, Rachel. Um, and this is just a, another image, and I want to show just a few more images of the Carters um, and in the last uh, decade or so. Um, and the way in which they have engaged with art at collections in the United States um, and abroad. And this is a, an image of the Carters um, at the Menil Foundation, or Menil Collection, excuse me, um, in Houston um, in 2016 in front of uh, two Mark Rothko uh, paintings. And if I could have the next slide, please, Rachel. Um, and here uh, we see them um, in 2014 um, at the Domino Sugar Factory um, at the Kara Walker uh, exhibition entitled A Subtlety of the Mar Marvelous uh, Sugar Baby. Um, it's a very long 19th century title uh, that we have and you can read it there. Um, a very popular exhibition that uh, took place at the Domino Sugar Factory uh, in Brooklyn before it was demolished. Um, and, uh, and how, um, and this was a, a, you know, a way that they, um, not only made the rounds within the art world in, in New York, as many people did at that time, um, but they're also here, I think, demonstrating a way in which they're um, not, in, not only interested in the work by, um, by Walker, but also in, interested in the way in which she is um, very much drawing on the history of slavery and the slave trade um, and the way in which enslaved Africans uh, not only uh, uh, picked sugarcane and, um, and had to be uh, made to labor in order to produce sugar um, in a place uh, that that was refined here in the in the in the Domino Sugar Factory, um, but how you know this connection between laboring and sugar um, has very much to do with a certain kind of uh, lineage and rec re re racial reckoning um, at the turn, um, uh, rather rather in 2014, especially at a time when. Um, this building is being demolished um, and, and you know, taken away from uh, the shores alongside the East River to make way for gentrification that's going to um, ultimately and has uh, displaced many uh, people of color, especially African-Americans who would have lived in and around these, these neighborhoods. And so there's a way in which, if I could have the next slide, please. 
uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z through their work. And this is uh, just a still from uh, um, the Lemonade album uh, from Information. Um, have always been attuned to um, these issues that you know have have plagued um, African Americans, have plagued us um, in not only in the in the twentieth century, but also relating again, as we saw in the last image, um, to um, our history of becoming part of a diaspora here in the United States. And so here, um, this is also obviously a work you know that plays a huge commentary. Um, on the after effects that we still feel um, from the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina. Um, there are ways that, if I could have the next slide, please, Rachel. We also see, um, again, you know, this draw to uh, famous uh, artists um, of modernism, famous artists like Picasso, um, and uh, uh, a portrait here of uh, Beyonce um, next to Picasso's portrait of Francoise uh, from 1946, a pencil on paper a drawing at the Picasso Museum. This is a portrait that was taken probably on that same uh, trip in 2014. Um, could I please have the next slide, Rachel? And so it's clear here too that uh, Beyonce and Jay-Z um, have also collected and uh, very frequently and in, in, uh, collect works by African-American artists and also admire and visit uh, places where African-American art is on view. Um, we saw that in the example um, of um, the Kara Walker exhibition at the Domino Sugar Factory. We see this here um, with a work by uh, Carrie James Marshall, his untitled uh, crowning moment from 2014 that was at the David's Werner Gallery in London um, in 2014. Uh, again, playfully, um, you know, uh, posing in front of this image um, and, you know, sort of uh, trying to, in, in, in a sense, you know, uh, mimic the same posture as the figure painted uh, by Carrie James Marshall. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see how, you know, well-versed um, uh, Beyonce is, especially, and even I would say it's not just the pose, but it's also the, the clothing that she wears um, a, as a way to kind of refer to, um, it, you know, the, the figure that is painted by uh, Carrie James Marshall uh, behind her. Rachel, could I have the next slide, please? And so here I'm showing you an image um, of Carrie James Marshall's uh, uh, pastimes uh, from 1967 um, and the sale that took place at Sotheby's Contemporary Art uh, Auction. Um, it was an evening auction sale in 2018. Um, and, and I thought that this would be a good way to transition to just think about some of the numbers, the dollars and cents and the places where works of art are being sold and the kinds of history that certain artists um, and auction houses themselves are, are making um, in the sale of uh, African-American um, and contemporary African art as well. And so um, I just wanna read a quote. Um, this is uh, Andrew Massad, who's the deputy chairman in the post-war and contemporary art department at the International Auction House uh, uh, Christie's. Um, and um, he, he discussed the price history of the artist, uh, Carrie James Marshall um, in paintings. And he said, in 2006, 2007, we began selling uh, Carrie James Marshall's paintings at auction. It was a very narrow audience, uh, he says but very loyal and prices were in the 50,000 to $100,000 range." Uh, and in quote, um, in, in November uh, uh, 2007, a large work sold for $541,000. That opened the eyes of people who hadn't been looking, said Mossad. Then the same piece came back on the auction block in 2014, selling for over $1 million. By 2017, a painting only two years old went for more than $5 million, well above its high estimate of $1.5 million. Uh, Rachel, could I have the next slide, please? And so in 2018, uh, we see that uh, Marshall's uh, pastimes uh, sold for a record $21.1 uh, million. Um, and this was a record uh, at the time for work by a living African-American artist. 
Um, also, I think it's important to note, um, if those of you who are um, in our Zoom webinar this evening don't know, but um, the hip hop mogul Sean Diddy Combs purchased this painting um, at this record figure. And um, I think it's really important here to, you know, to note and to begin to think about, you know, Black people actually collecting the work of other Black people um, at auction and at, at prices, um, you know, of this high level uh, at this time. So, so it's the really important landmark sale um, that makes us think about, you know, not just what happened and and I want to, you to kind of meditate for a second on um, the quote by Massad, but you know what happened between uh, approximately 2004, 2005, 2006, and 2018. You know how is it that the art market, uh, especially the contemporary art market, has changed um, writ large, but also the market, especially for works by African and African American art. How has that changed um, in a, approximately you know, 10 to 15 uh, year range? Are there exhibitions that have taken place that have traveled around the country or globally that have brought to the fore uh, the notice of works by African American or African artists? Um, or have there been other elements um, within the art industry and the art world that have really changed the way um, more collectors and, and more people interested, including museums, um, have been thinking about the work of African American art as being inclusive of African, uh, excuse me, inclusive of American art, but also uh, much part of a larger global um, art market. Could I please have the next slide, Rachel? And so here I'm showing you an image of Kerry James Marshall. Um, he's painting a mural entitled Rushmore in 2017 on the west side of the Chicago Cultural Center. Um, and, um, and this is a, a work that honors 20 women who played uh, an instrumental roles in developing uh, the city's cultural scene from founders of museums and arts publications to literary icons. And among some of these celebrated women are people like the poet Gwendolyn Brooks, the Afrikobra co-founder Barbara Jones Hogu, and Lois Weisberg, who was the first and longest serving commissioner of the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, this was a work that was uh, commissioned um, as part of Chicago's Year of Public Art, which is a citywide program that represents a $1.5 million investment in the artist-led community projects. Could I please have the next slide? And again, to think about uh, Marshall's work, um, there, there's another example that I wanted to share. Um, and, and this is kind of, again, you know, looking at not just the period from approximately 2004, five, six to 2018, when we see the record sale of Marshall's pastime uh, at Sotheby's, but also um, looking at how uh, at, at a certain point, uh, sometimes it's museums, and in, in this case um, here it was um, uh, the city of Chicago that decided um, at one point to uh, have a plan to auction and deaccession uh, a work by Carrie James Marshall. This is called Knowledge and Wonder uh, from 1995. This is the image I'm showing you now. Um, it's at the Chicago Public Library. Um, and, you know, after this was publicized and widespread criticism arose, uh, they decided against this tactic. And this was something that they were planning to do um, as the market for Marshall's work um, uh, began to, um, you know, be very clearly on the rise. So this would have been uh, around 2018 after that very famous sale. Um, and, um, you know, Marshall, Kerry James Marshall himself said, you know, that it was the right decision, obviously, for them not to sell that work. If you can imagine a beautiful uh, painting, you know, that's in a place of knowledge that, you know, has <laughs> the title itself, Knowledge and Wonder, um, in, you know, a library to be taken off of uh, the walls to be sold, who knows, probably to a, a private collector. Um, J uh, James, uh, Carrie James Marshall goes on to say, um, that you know the proposed sale seemed like a way of exploiting um, the works of artists in the city uh, for short-term gain in a really short-sighted kind of way, he says. 
it certainly would make one believe there's no reason to do anything because you have some kind of civic pride as a citizen. Um, and so that painting was withdrawn uh, from the November 15th auction that was to take place at Christie's. Um, and at that time, uh, when it was in the auction, it had carried a, a, um, a, a pre-sale estimate of 10 to $15 million. Um, and the library uh, itself, rather the city of Chicago only paid um, at the time of purchase uh, $10,000 um, for this 10 by 23 foot long painting. Um, again, I mentioned a painting that, you know, actually depicts um, black people, children, adults, um, standing before an array of larger than life books, you know, this thirst for and love of knowledge that we all know. Um, and so the other important point about this is, again, to really think about the ways in which um, there's so many connections that you have between city and local governments, um, between artists, uh, between auction houses, um, as part of, you know, an art, art market. Um, the City of Chicago Public Art Program that commissioned um, this work, it was commissioned as part of a percent for art ordinance. And I'm sure that some of you are aware of this. This is an ordinance that requires that Chicago's municipal construction projects spend 1.33% of their budget on public art. And funds from the sale would have gone toward a massive expansion project of the of the branch of the library where this is housed. Um, so this did not happen, but I just wanted to sort of give an example of how um, at certain times, you know, um, when, when an artist um, like Marshall and others um, all of a sudden take off at auction, uh, sometimes uh, there are, are people who are trying to, you know, I think for um, on the one hand, the, the idea of, of renovating um, and expanding the library, that was a good thing, but to sell this work, um, which is all about, you know, knowledge um, uh, would have, I think, really uh, been a great loss for the library itself. Rachel, could I please have the next slide? Um, and then I just wanted to share another work um, that, you know, is a pretty prominent work um, that really um, made us think more about the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat, and this is a a work that was sold in 2017, his untitled um, uh, work here, um, and it sold uh, for uh, over $110 million. And it, you know, it's, it's the type of thing where um, you know, this breathtaking sales price um, was you know, the most expensive work ever sold um, at auction by any American, regardless of, of race, regardless of background. Um, and, uh, and this is, you know, again, Basquiat's work. So to think about, um, you know, the way in which works like this come up for sale at auction, but also who, um, who's, who's collecting and, and who's buying. Um, but I wanna get back to Beyonce and Jay-Z for just one second. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, and here is just, you know, just for a moment to think about, you know, the way in which, um, you know, the work that they do, um, you know, as, as leaders, um, and I think it's important to think about, you know, leaders within um, not just the music industry, but also, you know, in culture. Um, how in this example here for, for um, Halloween uh, in 2014, they dressed up as you can see uh, as Frida Kahlo um, and, uh, and Basquiat. And then could I have the next slide please, Rachel? Um, these are just some of the, the works uh, from their collection. Again, a few of the artists that they're crazy in love with. And uh, taking note of the time, and I know we started a little bit late, I just wanna quickly go through some of the next images and transition to looking at Swizz Beats. Um, and uh, if I could have the next slide, are you on, on the, the no commission slide, Rachel? Let's see. Okay, yes. great. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, just to, to think about, again, another pair, another couple, um, that, you know, happens to, um, you know, come from the music industry as well, um, that, you know, it's very much involved um, in the art industry, um, supporting uh, artists of color, um, and also supporting other uh, causes that are leading to um, social change. Artists who, uh, like Beyonce, um, Swizz Beats is very active on Instagram, and often uh, when 
when he posts um, a work of art or an artist that he favors, um, especially uh, works of art by um, up and coming artists, um, artists that he himself um, happens to stumble upon, um, how many people quickly uh, follow his lead, literally, and uh, begin to collect these, these artists. Um, he's known uh, especially uh, um, with Alicia Keys for um, the No Commission um, uh, exhibition that takes place, um, especially at Art Basel Miami, um, and how um, this is a, a, a way in which, you know, um, artists um, can sell their works, artists who might be up and coming and new on the scene um, without having to um, uh, deal with um, the types of commissions that they might normally have to deal with uh, in terms of working um, with dealers um, and galleries. Um, and he's also someone, um, for those of you who I'm sure have probably already seen um, the recent uh, 2021 HBO documentary, Black Art in the Absence of Light, um, he's someone who's pretty heavily uh, featured um, in that documentary, um, especially um, his Dean collection. And, and he, you know, um, in the documentary talks about, you know, why he began um, um, the collection. And he says it's, quote, an imagination museum uh, for his children. Um, so his, his impetus, uh, together with Alicia Keys, was a way to begin collecting um, as an example um, for his children. And I think, again, to highlight the importance of the Black family, we see that with Beyonce um, and Jay-Z as well. Um, when, when we see them in Paris or in New York, um, uh, you know, taking Blue Ivy uh, with them to these um, exhibitions, um, or even dressing up with her um, for, you know, for Halloween. And so um, his collection too is very much uh, paired um, with activism. Um, in the way that he uh, curates um, at Art Basel Miami um, in No Commission, um, and also um, where you know, um, they are, are also frequently um, posting and tagging uh, Black artists um, that he likes to promote, as I said earlier. Um, could I please have the next slide, Rachel? Um, they've been supporters, of course, of the work of Gehende Wiley, um, and here they are posing in front of Passing Posing Annunciation in 2005. Um, and also um, Swiss, uh, Swiss Beats, um, or Dean also uh, talks about the work of, of Gordon Parks. Um, and here uh, there's an image on the left of him at an exhibition um, uh, of, of the collection, of the Dean collection, but also on the right, an image by Gordon Parks is probably most famous work uh, American Gothic from the Farm Security Administration um, in, uh, in 1942. Um, and so he prides himself as having, um, you know, one of the, the largest uh, private collections of the work of Gordon Parks. Um, and also the importance of, I think, not just collecting that work, um, but also showing that work in an educational setting. Again, thinking about the relationship between um, educating his own children with his, his collection, um, but also showing it in an educational setting. Could I have the next slide, please? I wanna transition um, quickly just to talk about a couple of contemporary artists um, um, who are uh, in a section of the book that's um, on um, foundations and the kinds of foundations that we as black people can build for ourselves and for our communities. And here I'm showing you an image of the contemporary artist Titus Kafar um, at a press tour of Next Haven, um, which um, he uh, uh, built um, in New Haven, uh, where he studied um, at the Yale School of Art, uh, a community-based center uh, for up and coming artists that includes 19 professional studio spaces um, and shared co-working spaces, a black box theater, and also a world-class art gallery. Um, and could I have the next slide, please? Um, and the other thing I, I just wanted to share is, that, and, and if you haven't seen this TED Talk um, by Kafar, um, I highly recommend it. It's, it was from 2017, um, in which he uh, shows us shifting the, the gaze and, and you know, talks about how important it is to shift the gaze, uh, especially in some of these um, you know, 18th and 19th century uh, uh, paintings um, and, you know, European paintings that would have showed 
uh, enslaved Africans as part of um, of a painting, but really not um, shown shown them sort of the, their due um, in terms of having uh, one's gaze focus upon them. And this is a um, a really important um, way to really not just think about painting, but also to really think about you know what's in your purview, what's in your cognitive map. Um, what do you see? What don't you see? How do you see people within the works of art if we're talking about something figurative, but also if we want to talk about shifting the gaze, um, I would apply that especially uh, to, you know, the art industry, um, especially to, uh, you know, the world of museums as well, um, as we shift the gaze to think about, you know, who are our patrons, um, what are our collections, um, what's important to put on view and, and collect and, and so on. Um, could I please have the next slide? Another artist um, who's doing really important work um, and has been uh, since 2007 is Carrie Mae Weems um, in um, her community engagement project entitled Social Studies 101. Um, and this is a a project that uh, has been going on um, for um, since 2007. Um, uh, where um, she's really interested in, in doing a number of different works and working with, um, with people collectively, um, you know, to think about how we might um, envision a different type of world. Um, and so the center features a program, um, Social Studies 101, um, Institute of Sound and Style, which is for 15 to 21 year old people um, who work during the summertime and they introduce them to different uh, career paths for art professionals. Um, and this is just an example here in this slide of a project um, that's a public art program uh, and campaign to promote wearing masks um, for COVID uh, safety and to encourage people um, during the pandemic. Um, so on the one hand, the example of Kafar is actually a brick and mortar space um, that provides studio space and other kinds of space um, in the work of Carrie Mae Weems. Uh, it's as if she goes from you know, one community to the next um, with social studies and it's a different idea and a different approach. Could I please have the next slide, Rachel? Another example here is Art Plus Practice. Um, uh, which was uh, conceived and founded by artist uh, Mark Bradford um, and philanthropist and collector Eileen Harris Norton and social activist uh, Alan DeCastro. Um, and um, it's, it's, a, it's been um, operating uh, since 2015. It's in Lamert Park, um, a, a traditionally African-American uh, neighborhood in LA. Um, and it, it really supports not just um, the arts um, with new exhibitions, um, and, but it also supports the community um, and including um, uh, providing access um, to, uh, to not only the programs that they run, um, but also to uh, exhibitions, access as well to things like career planning and other things. So it's not just an, an art exhibition space for, um, for contemporary art, but it's also a space for, um, for the way that you might think about planning your own career. Um, and just to think again about creating brick and mortar spaces, but also spaces that help to revitalize and rejuvenate um, communities and uh, rejuvenate, for example, um, foster youth who can receive life skills training, have access to housing opportunities and individualized education and employment, um, and also to support um, the way in which youth can begin to learn um, different skill sets. So it's a really important uh, contribution, especially um, in the city of Los Angeles, and a different model um, to that of Carrie Mae Weems Social Studies or um, Titus Kafar's Next Haven. And this is just another example um, of you know, showing you um, a, a, um, a, the artists in, um, in LA um, with the Astrid Gates. Um, Mark Bradford and Rick Lowe, and Rick Lowe is someone um, who, whose project uh, Row Houses um, in Houston is another really important model um, to think of, as is um, uh, Project Rebuild, um, which is the Astor Gates's uh, uh, a way of sort of giving back to the community in the city of Chicago. Uh, Rachel, could I have the next slide, please? Okay, and I just wanted to show you here um, 
a, a really uh, uh, just amazing um, work, um, a new work um, uh, by uh, Bradford um, uh, that um, is a, a work um, called a 150 portrait zone um, from 2020. Um, and it's uh, been uh, purchased by the LA County Museum of Art. Um, and it's a, you know, in, in his traditional fashion on the one hand, um, somewhat abstract, um, but it's actually um, a work, uh, this very large composition that reveals um, in the words that you see there, the last words of Philando Castile uh, before a St. Paul, Minnesota police officer um, uh, uh, killed him uh, as his fiance uh, streamed the entire event on, on Facebook. Um, and so the, the title uh, 150 Portrait Zone refers to the name and color code of the pink acrylic used throughout the painting and offers more insight into uh, Bradford's in intention um, with this painting. Um, so again, to kind of think about the, not just the relationship of these uh, different um, sites that artists themselves have established. Can I have the next slide please, Rachel? Um, including, I mentioned uh, Theaster Gates's uh, rebuild in Chicago. Could I have the next slide please? Um, and also Kehende Wiley's uh, Black Rock in, in, in Senegal. Um, you know, to think about how um, not just in the United States, but globally, we can consider ways to build foundations for artists practicing for the exhibition of artists, but also for our own communities, um, whether they be in brick and mortar spaces or traveling um, and inspiring young people. Um, I think also looking at the work of um, Kehende Wiley and Amy Sherald um, through their paintings of the presidential uh, portraits that were on view um, at the National Portrait Gallery of President Barack Obama and Amy Sherald or other ways that we, we can think about um, influencing and shifting the gaze um, uh, to borrow from Titus Kafar within uh, the art and museum world. Could I have the next slide please, Rachel? And so uh, this is a, an image that I, I hope everyone um, here has already seen, whether it's in person or um, on the cover of the Obama portraits or um, in, in the, the media. Uh, but uh, Candy Wiley, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, painted uh, the portrait of uh, President Obama and Amy Sherald painted the portrait of uh, Miss, Mrs. Obama. Um, and, and again, like the example of um, the the Carter's video at the Louvre, um, the presidential portraits um, boosted the, the attendance at the National Portrait Gallery um, to 2.3 million people the year that they were first on view at the National Portrait Gallery, um, which was a million more that was um, uh, than, than they had um, in previous times. And so um, it's really important again to think about access um, and how this sort of shifts, you know, who is who feels comfortable in the museum, uh, seeing portraits of, of, uh, and images that might seem like portraits that are familiar to them of people that they may know. Um, and you know, this, is, this is also important to consider in terms of the way um, the museum has not only um, begin to really look inside of itself and to reimagine the kinds of exhibitions that it might hold, um, to even reimagine you know, what it might look like to rehang the presidential galleries and other galleries that are uh, part of a, an institution that has been um, in the United States for, for some time. And so since the unveiling attendance at the NPG more than doubled, and after the, two, the first two weeks from the unveiling over 4,000 articles um, were um, written covering these, uh, these portraits um, that were also distributed. And I'm mentioning these numbers because I think they make a difference. And I want you to think about sort of this reverberating effect um, but you know these over 4,000 articles in the press um, were circulated to uh, probably over 1.25 billion people. So again, to think about you know what that means um, in terms of how many people were were reached, um, and these portraits are going to be um, they're going on tour. Um, they'll come to the High Museum. I know that they're going to go to LACMA and I think approximately four other museums um, in the United States. And this is, of course, um, Amy Sherald's portrait of uh, Mrs. Obama. 
Um, I would re be remiss if I didn't talk about the role of curators, especially the role of Thelma Golden, the director of the Studio Museum in Harlem, um, and the way in which we talk about and think uh, about how leadership uh, makes a difference. Um, and and um, our program, as, as many of you know, um, was in part um, inspired by the reporting and studies that were done by the Mellon Foundation in 2015 and 2018 um, on leadership um, in, uh, in major museums and uh, which found um, that uh, in 2015 that only 2% of curators uh, were African-American. By 2018, that number doubled, but we all know that that's just not enough. Um, we also can talk about these kinds of numbers as they relate to not just the, the role of the curator or the director of the museum, but also museum staffs and boards. We can talk about things like um, even conservation for that matter. Um, and uh, Aaron Christavale um, on the right um, is, is just one of only two black curators um, working at, at the Hammer Museum. Um, and, you know, Krista Vale has been quoted as saying that, you know, mentorship is, is a start. That is, you know, if you have someone and our program prides itself in really uh, mentoring our students, um, that you have a mentor, uh, that that's one of the ways that you can continue to not only learn about your field, but also um, have uh, access to opportunities that your mentor um, or sponsor, sponsor will share with you. Um, and, um, so, so one of the things that I know um, Golden is very hard um, at work on because she too believes um, in mentorship is really making sure that um, African American students who are, you know, working to become a part of the art industry and the art world to fill positions within museums and auction houses and other places that they have um, access uh, to mentors. Um, that it's a really important thing to have access to mentors and people um, who are you know, who are, for example, um, leaders uh, within their own fields. And <clears throat> another point that I just wanted to make statistically wise, statistic, excuse me, statistics wise, is that um, a 2017 survey that was done by the um, Association of Art Museums also found that um, 83 point, 89, excuse me, point three percent of museum board members in the U.S. Um, are white. And so I know that in the last year and a half, um, there have been a number of different um, initiatives, especially during you know this time that we've all been kind of living in and out of our Zoom boxes, um, and and ways that uh, many people who are in leadership positions have come together. Um, whether these are African Americans who serve on museum boards um, to say that we need to build an alliance of ourselves, whether it's an alliance of African American museum. Um, directors or an alliance of African American um, a gallery uh, um, and dealer, um, uh, a gallery gallery workers and and people who um, are working in the commercial art world. These kinds of alliances are the kinds of alliances that um, build networks for not just our students but for other people who are working in the art industry to support one another um, and to uh, mentor one another. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Rachel? And, um, and just as an, another example, again, to think about, you know, the impact that some of these um, initiatives are making, uh, the museum professionals, Latanya S. Autry and Mike Murawski uh, created um, in 2017, hashtag museums are not neutral. And we all know that um, in June of 2020, um, that the hashtag museums are not neutral had a really, really big and transformative effect on some of the actions that are being taken um, in the museum um, and in the art industry. Um, and these are some of the questions uh, that were being asked um, here. You know, what percentage of black art do you have in your collection? Is there black leadership? What efforts are you making towards decolonizing? So I want to spend the last few minutes, and I'm sorry that I've gone just a little bit over, um, but to return to um, this, this really important um, exhibition that is now on view um, at the Speed Museum of Art, Promise, Witness, Remembrance, um, curated by Allison Glenn um, for the Speed Museum of Art, um, and uh, just recently opened, uh, not even a week ago. Um, and I want us to kind of focus in um, on the amazing portrait uh, that 
uh, Amy Sherald uh, made um, of Brianna Taylor um, in her honor um, that we see here in the center um, in, in a space uh, that's very much a, a memorial space, a space of, of remembrance, a space of, of thought, a space of quiet, um, a space that um, uh, it is really important to consider how um, its location um, you know, in her uh, hometown is, is one that um, is relevant now today um, and I think will be relevant um, as this uh, exhibition uh, gets uh, more coverage and is more available uh, to people um, who go to see it. Um, I think if we look, could I have the next slide please, Rachel? Um, at, um, at Amy Sherald's uh, career just for a moment, um, and I'm showing you two different works, her bathers um, on the left from 2015, and then um, her portrait of Brianna Taylor um, uh, from 2020. Um, and so following the unveiling of the Obama portrait, which was actually her, her first commission, um, Sherald's career, um, as you uh, can imagine, skyrocketed, as well as uh, the value uh, market-wise uh, of her, her paintings. Um, and um, her second uh, commission came from uh, Vanity Fair uh, in 2020. Um, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, edited the, the September 2020 um, issue of Vanity Fair um, and commissioned her um, as part of that to do the cover. Um, and, um, and so, you know, one of the things that, you know, she, she actually took some time to, to think about, um, that is Sherald, um, whether or not she would accept that commission. She took time, uh, of course, to think about uh, Brianna Taylor's mother and how her mother would react to a portrait of her daughter on the cover of Vanity Fair. Um, and um, she also took some time to really think about, you know, who was Brianna Taylor to try to get to know um, who she was from family members, uh, from her mother, uh, from friends, um, as she uh, thought about how she would uh, paint this portrait. Um, she also took the time to engage a black designer uh, to design the dress that, that she has um, Brianna Taylor in. And, um, and she put on her, her finger, it's hard to see it um, in uh, this, this slide, but um, the engagement ring that her boyfriend was, was meant to, um, to give to her. And um, Sherald has been quoted as saying that she believes that this painting is her contribution to quote, the moment and activism, end quote. And she, um, she also, uh, again, cites the issue editor, ta Coates, as, quote, the only reason she accepted the commission. Um, and that was during a, another event that we had for a virtual career week um, that, she, that she said that. Um, because, you know, as I mentioned, um, uh, the, the way in which this came, came to be is, is, was during a time when, um, as many of you may recall, those of you who get sort of you know, popular magazines from Vogue to Vanity Fair, that in the, in the fall of 2020, many of those magazines had covers that were covers um, uh, that were uh, commissioned of black artists, whether they be painters or, or photographer, photographers. Um, and so, you know, there are also questions that come to the forefront um, as many family members of the unfortunately infamous victims of police violence examine how many so-called, you know, artists or activists and various personalities seek to profit and gain through, through their deaths. And so I think that's something that Amy Sherald was also very much mindful of when she accepted that, that commission. Legacy Russell, an associate curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem has tweeted the following questions, quote, are beautiful images dignity or justice? Is her family being compensated for the use of her image? And so on. So these are some of the questions that have come to the fore. Um, in response to the cover, um, that's, that's, uh, those are some of the questions that she had tweeted. Um, after the cover, uh, the, the painting, um, as many of you may know by now, remained in Sherald's studio. Um, and uh, there, were, there were many ways that people reached out to her to try to purchase it through her gallery. Um, a number of museums and, and so on tried to reach out to her to purchase it. 
Um, and she said that this is Sherald speaking now that she had to take herself and her career out of the equation um, and solely think about uh, Ms. Palmer, um, that is Brianna Taylor's mother. Um, and so, you know, she was um, aware of this, you know, of this difficulty of uh, a portrait like this. Um, and the painting ultimately was sold jointly to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington and the Speed Museum, uh, respectively, uh, for uh, $1 million. Um, and Sherald uh, plans for the proceeds um, uh, for uh, this from the sale of this painting um, uh, to go to go to a, a program um, that will benefit uh, students. Um, but you know, she she was also someone who thought this is Sherald again, who was really trying to rely on um, you know people that she was connected to and thinking about you know, where this, this painting will be placed. Um, again, another really important facet of when we think about the art industry and we think about collecting, uh, the difference between collecting something that is going to be on public view in an educational institution um, versus uh, uh, something that might be in a private collection. Sherald was very clear that she wanted uh, this painting to have access to, to people and also that um, it would be something that would be close to the family. Uh, Brianna Taylor. Um, the, the painting was purchased um, uh, um, with funds that were um, uh, given by the Ford Foundation, uh, Darren Walker in charge, and also the Hearthland Foundation, um, uh, which is a foundation that's headed by Kate Capshaw, who's a, a friend of uh, Amy Sherald and also the husband of Steven Spielberg. Um, uh, and and the, the proceeds, again, are going to assist students um, in social justice uh, with scholarships. So students who are interested in, in studying social justice um, in, in scholarships. So, um, you know, I, I just, again, I think it's important to think about the history of this painting coming into being, um, but also to think about it in relationship to um, her other works, uh, for example, The Bathers, which you see here in comparison. Um, and, and her success is further emphasized again in, in the December 2020 sale at Sotheby's of this painting, The Bathers, um, which was estimated initially at 150,000 to 200,000, and it instead sold for uh, $4.3 million. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Rachel? And I only have one more after this one, I promise. <laughs> so, um, so again, I just wanted to show you an installation shot um, from um, her exhibition that's on view at the Speed Museum. Um, it's not a large show. There are uh, approximately um, 30 works. And this is a, a room um, wherein you see um, a work by Hank Willis Thomas uh, to the right and a work um, in front of We the People uh, by, by Nari Ward. Um, and you know, again, um, I think it's really important to consider um, the way in which um, this exhibition not only came together inspired um, by the work of Amy Sherald, by that cover um, of Vanity Fair, inspired by that painting, inspired by the memory of uh, Breonna Taylor. Um, and it's an exhibition that came together um, in just a short amount of time, not even an entire year, not even six months, it came together. Um, and I'm just going to read um, a, a quick uh, quote from uh, Holland Cotter of the New York Times who reviewed the show on April 11th, just a couple days ago. Um, and he says the resulting show isn't, isn't huge, it's around 30 pieces, but the museum has given it prime space, clearing out three permanent collection galleries on either side of its sculpture filled central atrium to accommodate it. This guarantees that individual works have a room to breathe it also symbolically offers a gesture of welcome on the part of a traditional museum to a display of black contemporary art, end quote. It's also important to note that, you know, uh, Darren Walker also uh, gave uh, $1.2 million for the realization of the exhibition, but also to make admission to the Speed Museum of Art free of charge so that people could come in to see this. Again, talking about access and talking about, you know, the true dollars and cents of uh, the art industry. And um, I'd like to uh, just close again on us, you know, looking at, at this image here again um, of the portrait um, that inspired this exhibition 
um, to say that I've really enjoyed sharing uh, this work with you this evening. And I hope that we can um, continue to really bring important and pressing uh, contemporary issues to bear um, on the art industry um, and the way in which we can look at the multifaceted, faceted, excuse me, um, uh, um, the multifaceted art industry, um, that it's, it's not just um, only about uh, sales at commercial galleries um, or by private dealers or in um, auction houses that we know that become public, but rather it's about um, uh, you know, the decisions that artists make about where they want their works to be cited, where they want their works to be collected, and the impact that those works will have on the communities um, that can see them. It's about who has access to museums, who has access to galleries, who has access to, um, to be able to see and learn from this work, and who has access to be able to be part of the art industry um, and the art world uh, writ large. And I think finally, you know, in, in talking about, um, uh, you know, being crazy in love uh, with collecting, um, we can also continue to look um, to uh, some of the celebrity figures that uh, not only are collectors of art, um, who are not only uh, people who are trendsetters, but who are people who set trends that are trends of relevance and trends that, that um, have to do um, uh, with helping to um, uh, you know, mend um, the wounds of structural racism um, and mend those wounds, uh, especially um, in the way that we interact um, in and around uh, the art world and the art industry. Thank you.